Well, I was thinking about this this week, that one of life's great questions is this, why am I here? Why am I here? Um, I heard about a young preacher. He was just getting started in ministry, and he was trying to take every opportunity he could to preach. And um, he, he contacted the local hospital, and they allowed him to come in and speak to a group of people. What he did not realize was he was speaking to a group of people that were in the mental health care there. And uh, so he goes to the uh, group, and he's preaching and being very eloquent, and he asks a rhetorical question. He said, so I ask you, why are we all here? One guy kind of raised his hand in the back. He said, I don't know about you, but we're all here because we ain't all there. <laughs> well, the question is, why are we here? Not, are we not all there? But that's one of life's greatest questions, isn't it? Why am I here? God, do you have me as a part of your great cosmic plan? Am I simply an accident? Did, did you actually plan me, God? Or uh, am I just here as a random uh, piece of matter? Well, we know the answer to that is that uh, God has us here for a reason. There is a reason that you were created. And ultimately, the reason you were created was to be loved by God forever. You're not an accident. You're not an afterthought. Your parents may not have planned you, but God definitely planned you. And here's what I know uh, from Scripture is that our relationship with God forms the true meaning of life. In fact, apart from a relationship with God, you cannot fully appreciate life or its meaning. There is no way to know true love apart from experiencing the love of God. Oh, you can find Hollywood versions. You can even find maybe temporary emotions. But to truly understand love, you must be in relationship with God. There's no way that you can understand true joy in family, true joy and pleasure in your work. Uh, true God-designed pleasure in life that leads us to worship. It's impossible from, um, apart from a deeper relationship with God's love. And when God demonstrates his love to us, he does it through his son, Jesus Christ. Well, Revelation chapter 5, where we're going to read today, really shows us the answer to why we're here. It really gives us the foundation for the meaning of life. It really helps us understand why we are here and how we are a part of God's eternal cosmic plan. And so today we're going to look in Revelation chapter 5. For those of you that are just joining us, we're in this series called The Lamb, the Lion, and the Warrior King, and we're looking at the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we have discovered this that the theme might be different than what you raised up, were raised up being taught, but the theme is about Jesus Christ. The theme is that Jesus wins. And in fact, in the very first sentence of the book of Revelation, we find the true meaning of the book, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what God does for us here is reveals to us not only how much God loves us, not only that uh, God has a plan for our lives, not only that Jesus is just, not only that justice will prevail, not only that we're going to be a part of God's plan through all of eternity, but what we're going to see today is this, that Jesus truly is worthy. Jesus truly is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our faith. He's worthy of our trust. He is worthy, if, you, if I will, I can put it in this term, in these kinds of terms, that he's worthy of having the benefit of the doubt. And don't act like that you're so pious that you've never doubted God or never doubted God's plan or never doubted what Jesus wanted to do in your life. We've all done that. We've all been there but what I know is this, even though I may not see tomorrow, I know God does, 
Even though I may not understand everything that I'm going through right now, I know that God has a plan and Jesus is worthy of the benefit of the doubt. And so today we're going to read from Revelation chapter 5 what the Bible tells us about Jesus being worthy. We'll begin in verse number 1. And then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Remember the number seven is about completion. It's the number of God. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Aren't you glad that Jesus conquered death? Aren't you glad that Jesus conquered sin? Aren't you glad that Jesus conquered the devil? Jesus is the conquering king. He said, Jesus is the lion of Judah, the root of David. He has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now, wait a minute. A lamb that had been slain, but it was standing. What does that mean? It just simply refers to the fact that Jesus died on the cross and he is alive today. He was dead and now he is alive. He is the lamb that it seemed like he had been slain, but now he's standing. And notice how it describes him with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent throughout the earth. And can I just encourage you, Don't be freaked out when you read some of the imagery in the book of Revelation. The idea of seven horns, does Jesus literally have horns on his head? No. The seven horns, particularly in ancient times, that represented power. It represented political power and absolute power. And Jesus is telling us that he has all power. In fact, after he resurrected and right before he ascended back to heaven in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And then those eyes represents the fact that Jesus is omniscient, that Jesus sees all, that he knows all. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you know that when you pray, it's a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God? Even when you pray out of pain, even when you pray out of sorrow, Even when you pray out of joy, you don't have to be always happy when you pray. Did you know that? In fact, I tell people, unless you have ever truly been able to openly vent toward God, I don't mean blasphemy or being disrespectful, but has it ever dawned on you that you might as well be honest and talk with God because he already knows what you're thinking anyway? Do you really think you're hiding your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings from God God wants us to have that closeness to him, the ability to pray. It's like incense in his nostrils. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God And they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. You need to understand that back when this was originally written, they didn't use word like billions. 
or trillions. And what he was simply saying was here that it's innumerable. We can't even count it. He says there's innumerable people saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. That simply means so be it or truth. It's true, they said. And the elders fell down and worshiped. I want to give you just uh, three thoughts. It won't be very long today because uh, we are coming back tonight for the night of worship. But I just want to give you three thoughts from this passage that I believe if you will internalize them and think about them and meditate on them, that they'll make not only your day better, they'll make your life better. And I believe it'll have a profound impact on your outlook and a profound impact on your attitude and on your worship. And here's the first thought that I want you to get. And it was actually stated right here in this passage. And here it is. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Now, not everything in this life is worthy of praise. You agree with that, right? You understand that, right? But Jesus is worthy. And I want you to see some of the descriptions that were given to him and explain them just a little bit so that That will be a blessing to you. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I know we even have that in the title of our series, but you may not know where that comes from. Some of you probably just assumed that uh, that was some vague reference uh, from the Old Testament. But did you know this was actually a prophecy made by Jacob on his deathbed? And he was prophesying over his son Judah. He was prophesying over all 12 of his sons. But listen to what he said about Judah and get the implication of what was being said prophetically about what the seed of Judah, the descendants of Judah would be like one day. Genesis chapter 49 verse 8, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Did you know that Jesus is going to be praised? Throughout all of eternity, that was prophetic in nature. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Jesus conquers. The Bible tells us that at every, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He said, your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. In other words, he conquered. He bows down and he lies down as a lion and as a lion. Who shall rouse him? In other words, he does what he wills. He does what he plans. He's sovereign. He's all powerful. And the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The Bible says that Jesus is that eternal king. He will be that forever ruler. And it says that he is the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. In other words, Jesus, referring to him, would be the ruler, the Lord, the king, the one that not only gives the law, but that fulfills the law for us until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And then I want you to see the prophetic words that Jacob uttered about this future offspring of Judah. And it says, in essence, that he was going to shed his blood on a cross. He was going to ride a donkey into Jerusalem. Just exactly what happened. Listen to what he said. Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed His garments in wine and his his clothes in the blood of grapes. What was described there was that one day Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the one that was there in the beginning with God, 
the one that helped speak into existence. He was literally the word of God. The very one that created humanity would one day die for us. He would die in our place and he would wash his clothes in the blood of grapes. In other words, he would shed his blood for you and for me. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus is worthy. He's also, it referred to him there in Revelation as the the root of David. It says in Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, okay? He's the offspring. Uh, David is the offspring, so he's the, of the root of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see. In other words, he's not gonna be influenced by what he sees because he knows all. He's a righteous judge or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? It's talking about being humble enough, meek enough to admit to God that you have sinned, that you need forgiveness, that there is no hope apart from his love and his grace for you. And he says that he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy. He is the lamb who ransoms us. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7, and he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus died in our place and he lives today. I love what it said there in Revelation. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Here was the lamb that was dead and he is now alive. And not only is he alive today, he is going to be alive forevermore. He will always be living and mediating and loving And blessing our lives. He is the warrior king who conquers. It says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. This is what Jesus said. He has been given all authority. Those seven horns, horns, as we said, represent his conquering power. So Jesus is worthy. Here's the second thing. Jesus is to be worshipped. I realize this is pretty simple. But when you think about it, it's very profound. Jesus is not only worthy of our worship, he is to be worshiped. We owe that to him. He alone can open the book of life. I love the fact that they looked throughout heaven and they couldn't find anyone that was worthy to open the book. But Jesus said, I'll go, I'll do it. I am the one. Jesus is to be worshiped. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, um, talking about at the end of time. Listen, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and then another book was open, which is the book of life. Did you know that when you follow Jesus as your Savior, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? In fact, Because God knows all before it ever happened. God knew that you're going to be saved. And the Bible says before the foundation of the world that your name was written in the book of life for those that trust in him. Jesus is to be worshiped. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, O death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Jesus alone. Because he has conquered death, is able to open the book. And then Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, uh, God said about our sin, I will remember your sins no more. And that's good news. 
And that's why he's to be worshiped. And that's why we can trust him. That's why he is worthy. And then I want you to see the last thing, and I'm going to wrap this up. The last thing in this text that we look at today is not just the worthiness of Jesus, not just the fact that he should be worshiped, but the fact that Jesus is the one that empowers our witness. And I think when we read this text, we understand that what God wants us to do and we want what he wants us to know is that he does not want to keep this good news a secret. I mean, what would it be like if there was good news that was so great that it literally would change everyone in the world if they'd receive it? Well, there is good news like that, and it's the good news of Jesus that he died on the cross for our sins, but what good is it to people that have never heard the good news? And what the Bible is clearly teaching us is this, Jesus will empower your worship, but he will also empower your witness. You see, you don't have to be Billy Graham to be a witness. Do you know what a witness is? Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, and and Jesus actually said this, he says, and after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, when I was growing up, uh, the churches that I formed in, spiritually speaking, um, we used to have visitation programs. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a church that did that, but what we used to do, and this was back in the day before uh, you wouldn't get shot when you went up to somebody's house unannounced back in that day. And I can remember uh, going up to people's houses and knocking on their door, and they would come and open the door, and we were there to witness to them. We were there to invite them. And here's the opening question. I, I would say, my name is Richie Miller, and I'd say the church I was from, and then I would just jump right in. I'd say, I want to ask you a question. If you died today, would you go to heaven? Now, can you imagine a person that has never met you a moment in their life and you're standing on their porch and you have rung their doorbell and interrupted their day and the very first thing you ask them is not hi, how you're doing, not what's your day like, but if you were to die right now, what would happen to you? I'll be honest, I'm shocked that we didn't get shot, okay? Because Most people probably would have thought, hey, you know what? Uh, This person's here to harm me. Well, that's not what it means to be a witness. Do you know what a witness is? It's somebody that tells what they've seen. That's all a witness is. A witness is somebody that describes what they've seen. And here's what I know about you. You are an expert on your experiences, you are an expert on you. Now, I realize we may, we're not getting into the philosophical nature of that uh, question. What are you, what is the meaning of life? I, I'm not getting into the philosophical side of that. But here's what I know. You don't have to have a seminary degree to know what Jesus has done in your life. You don't have to be trained in order to tell somebody what God has meant in your life of how your life has changed since Jesus became a part of it. You are to be a witness. A witness simply tells what he's seen. And here's what you and I need to understand. God empowers our witness. And by that, I really do believe that he will give us those opportunities. And notice the last part. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll And to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Do you know when our job is done, when every person on the planet has had a chance to hear the good news of Jesus? Until then, you know what our job is? It's to be a witness. Oh, I don't mean that you have to get you a big old family Bible and stand out on the street corner and yell at cars as they pass by. I've seen people do that. Personally, I don't think that's very effective. I mean, how much conversation you're actually going to be able to have. Hey, I hope you don't go to hell, you know. 
But you know what God does do? He gives you relationships. He gives you people you work with. He gives you neighbors. He gives you family members. He gives you children and aunts and uncles and cousins and parents and grandparents. And he gives you uh, families that your children go to school with. He gives you opportunities to be a witness. And once again, you know what a witness does? Man, I just can't tell you how God has been working in my life. You know what? I, I really was really, really struggling, and I met Jesus. And man, it's not perfect. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not saying that. But man, my life is so much better than it was. You know what people are interested in? They're, they're interested in what you have witnessed. They're interested in your story. And Jesus will empower your witness. A new song here is an expression of praise for God's victory. He is the creator and the new creator. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And then we end with this verse, Psalm 40, verse 3. He has put a new song in my mouth. Talking about that relationship with God. When you meet Jesus Christ, God puts a new song. And I don't know what kind of music you like, but some of you probably like bluegrass. My dad loves bluegrass. My dad is, he'll be 78 years old on his birthday, and he is, he's got a weird musical taste, I'll be honest. He likes bluegrass, he likes country, he likes German marching band music for some reason. I've never met anybody that really liked that. My dad likes, he's 78 years old, he likes uh, New Kids on the Block. <laughs> I'm not making that up, okay? Um, and uh, what was the other one that was kind of like them? Uh, NSYNC. He likes NSYNC. And this is going to blow your mind. He's 78 years old. He likes bluegrass. He likes country. He likes Elvis. He likes all this stuff. And he likes, are you ready? And I swear on a stack of Bibles, this is true. He likes Tupac. <laughs> now, when my dad gets to heaven, I don't know really what kind of music there's going to be around him, Okay. He has such a weird, eclectic taste in music. I mean, how do you, you kind of rationalize in your mind a 78-year-old man that likes Tupac, okay? And NSYNC, I mean, for goodness sake. But here's what I do know. When you get saved, God says that he puts a new song in your mouth. A new song. Now, does that mean that uh, you don't like the kind of music that you like to? No, that's not what that means because I still love 80s metal, all right? That is just me. I love it. Uh, you know, if you really want to uh, have music that will put you close to God, Guns N' Roses is the ticket, okay? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And maybe Aerosmith, all right? So, um, so is he saying that when you get saved, you're not going to like the old kind of music you uh, used to like? No, that's not what I mean. That's not what I'm saying. Kim and I went and saw that Elvis movie not too long ago, and I loved it, okay? Uh, but, you know, if you're old enough to have liked Elvis when he first came out, you're old. All right, that's all I'm saying. You're old. But when you get saved, it doesn't mean you don't have to like Elvis anymore or Tupac or whoever. But you know what it does say about you when he puts a new song is that God has changed your life. He's put a new song. There is a fresh perspective. I'm able to see things that I wasn't able to see before. I'm able to see things differently. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Then notice what happens. Because this is what people notice about your witness. And I want you to take particular notice of the words that are used here. He has put a new song in my mouth, okay, that you know that a song, you're able to hear a song because of what? Because you can hear, right, of your ears. So that comes in through the ears. Praise to our God, many will see it. That's a weird turn of a phrase, isn't it? 
He was just talking about music. He was talking about a song. Oh, he's going to put a new song in my mouth. I'm going to be able to hear it. I'm going to be able to, uh, to sing it. I'm going to be able to say it. And many shall see it. Are they seeing the vibrations that come out of your mouth? No. You know what they see? They see God in you. They see change in your life. They see that you have a new life. They see that you're not perfect and you're not claiming to be, but that things have changed. Many will see it and fear. That doesn't mean that they're going to cower in fear. It means they're going to fear God. It's an act of worship. It's an act of respect. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. So what is he saying? Well, he will empower your witness. We have a saying here at Stillwater's Church that inviting is evangelism. And I really want to encourage you to take that opportunity to invite people. Talk about what you've seen. Talk about it at work. Talk about it at home. Talk about it in your family and at family reunions. I'm not saying be obnoxious. We all have those obnoxious people in our family that, does anybody have somebody that when it's at Thanksgiving time and everybody's starving to death, that they want to pray for every missionary they've ever heard of in the world, and they want to pray for every orphan in the world, and it's like, okay, uh, God gets it, okay? Shut up. Just say thank you and let's eat some turkey. I'm not talking about being obnoxious, but we're talking about letting others see in your life that you've got a new song, that you've got something to sing about, that you've got something to talk about. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, he has put a new song in your mouth. And many will see it. They're not going to see the music, but they're going to see the change. They're going to see your life They're going to see your new attitude. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Dear Jesus, help us to be that kind of witness. We pray that you would empower us to be that. Lord, we know that you're worthy. We know that you're worthy of worship. And we know that you will empower us to be a light to be a new song, to be a witness to those that are around us. Before I finish praying today, I wonder, online, do you need that new song? Do you need Jesus? In the room, do you need the new song? Well, you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, and it's simply a matter of faith. We say it's by faith because it's not by works. It's not because you're coming to church today that you can go to heaven. It's not because you were nice this week that you can go to heaven. It's not because you quit doing a particular thing. No, it's all because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Remember, he is the lamb that was standing though he'd been slain. He resurrected from the grave. He died on the cross. He shed his blood for you and me. And it's a matter of faith. And so maybe today you would say, you know what, pastor, I need, I need that relationship. Maybe you've been one of those people that you've been around church a lot. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe your grandmother has a brass plaque on the end of the pew down at the Methodist church because she gave to buy that pew when she was younger. Maybe you have that tradition in your background, but I got to let you know, your grandma's relationship with Jesus is no substitute for yours. And so today, you can call out to Jesus and say something like this, dear Jesus, you're worthy, and I'm trusting you as my Savior today. I don't understand everything about it. I just know that you died in my place and that you're alive today, and I'm asking you to forgive me. 
Can't do it on my own, but I know you can. If you'll say something like that in the room today, take a moment and fill out the next step card before you leave today. Online, go to the bottom of the screen and click that you pray to receive Christ today. And we'll follow up with you and help you. Maybe there's someone here today that would say, Pastor, I know that I, Jesus is worthy of worship, and I do worship him. But maybe what you got out of the message today was that Jesus empowers your witness, and maybe there's somebody you're praying for. It could be a relative. It could be a close friend. It could be somebody you work with. But you'd say, Pastor, there's somebody that I know and that I care for, and I want to pray that they would get saved as well. If you have somebody in mind like that, would you just raise your hand while no one's looking but me? A lot of people. All of us really, to be honest, should have our hands raised because we have a new song. And I hope you'll invite them today. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Jesus, thank you for being worthy. Thank you that we can worship you. Thank you for empowering our witness. And we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.